Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you guys so much for joining me here tonight. Um, this is a presentation about uh, Neighbors for More Neighbors, WNC. And we are presenting housing solutions for a sustainable future. I am Susan Bean. I am the uh, Housing and Transportation Director at Mountain True. And this is a program of Mountain True. Let me see if I can, oh, it's my slide here. I might try and figure out how to, how to, hang on, hold that thought, change it so it doesn't ding every time someone joins. It's been a minute since I did one of these. Do I find that setting? I used to know how to do this. No, I can't find it. Okay. Well, it'll just keep digging. We'll be happy to have everyone join. Um, yeah, so again, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is uh, a presentation about our newest Mountain True program, Neighbors for More Neighbors, WNC. And um, Mountain True, in case there are any of you who do not know um, about our organization, uh, is a grassroots environmental nonprofit that champions resilient forests, clean waters, and healthy communities across the Southern Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, we've been around for about 40 years, and Neighbors for More Neighbors, WNC, is our newest program. Oh, come on, I'll thing again. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> forgive the tech challenges on my end. Um, so one question you may be asking is whether housing is an environmental issue, because I framed Mountain True as an environmental organization. Um, and we would say yes, 100%. It really is. Um, our region desperately needs more housing. Uh, and where and how that housing is built has profound impacts on our natural environment. By building more diverse housing options closer to public amenities and where infrastructure already exists, we can meet our region's housing needs in a way that is more climate friendly and energy efficient, minimizes vehicle miles traveled, and reduces sprawling development that encroaches on our forests, farms, and green spaces. Oh, if I click it, does that. That's helpful. Um, so sprawling development trends severely threaten the natural landscapes, the old growth forests, and rare species habitat that make Western North Carolina such a beautiful and precious place. In this image on the screen, you can see a bird's eye view of a nature preserve that is outside Charlotte, North Carolina. As we sprawl, we are turning forests like this one into uh, places like this, suburbs and, and developments and, and houses and roads. Um, developments like this interrupt species habitat, increase sedimentation runoff into our rivers, our streams and our lakes and require that people drive further distances to reach jobs, schools, and amenities. However, there's a growing movement to return housing choices to our city centers. The more that we can build in and up, the more we can protect the mountains and trees and ecosystems of our natural landscape. Additionally, if we can walk or ride or take public transit to meet our daily needs, we are generating far less greenhouse gases, which further benefits our natural environment. I find this slide striking and this number striking really. Um, between 1976 and 2006, land development in the North Carolina mountains increased 568% from about 34,000 acres to almost 230,000 acres. And it is expected to increase another 63% by 2030. Population meanwhile increased only 42% between 1976 and 2006. The result of all of that is an increase in the average number of developed acres per person or the development footprint. So we are just all occupying more built environment space, more developed land. Um, back in the early 1900s, we built small compact homes. But with the advent of the highway system, our cars allowed us to live in the suburbs for the first time in history. And with that came large single family detached homes and government subsidies for mortgages and it became more profitable for developers to build larger houses on cheaper land further from city centers. And to accommodate that shift, 
We build new roads to these new to those new developments and new grocery stores and expand our infrastructure, our water and sewer systems, all of which is expensive to maintain. And this has likely gotten worse since 2006. This report came out in 2010 and had made these projections, but we have continued this pattern of sprawling development since, so it's possible these numbers are even worse now. So there are two crises that we face today that Mountain True and this Neighbors from More Neighbors WNC program seek to address. And that is a housing shortage and also climate change. So first let's talk a little bit more about this housing crisis. It is hard to miss hearing about the housing crisis these days from news reports on the need for affordable housing to the visible reminders of homelessness that we see on the city streets. And there are a lot of complicated factors that have gotten us to this place, but one of the pieces of this puzzle is a literal housing shortage. In an article called Deconstructing the Housing Crisis by Stephen Menindian, he writes that housing starts peaked in absolute terms in 1972. And housing starts refer to the number of new residential construction projects that have begun in any given month. This number of new projects beginning in a month has been declining consistently for over 50 years, even though the U.S. population has grown by 60% in that time. Um, there are various estimates for how short we are of homes in this country. Freddie Mac has estimated that the nation is short 3.8 million homes, and Fannie Mae's estimate is even higher at 4.4 million. Um, so generally, the United States produces far less housing on a per capita basis than it did in previous generations. And the housing that it does produce is far more expensive on a per unit basis. The American dream of a single family home on an acre lot with a white picket fence has gotten, that dream has gotten bigger and bigger. And the market has driven the housing industry to build larger and larger homes for the people who are able to afford that dream, which leaves a lot of people wishing they could own a home, but not having that opportunity. Here's some stats on the housing shortage in Western North Carolina as reported by the Western North Carolina Housing Needs Assessment, which is commonly referred to as the Bowen Report, uh, the Bowen Company being the firm that did the study. Um, but it estimated, and this came out in 2021, um, that the number of rental units that we needed, as in the, the lack, the shortage of rental units available across Western North Carolina, were over 13,000 units for families and over 7,000 units for seniors. And for sale units for you know um, ownership, uh, over 3,000 units for families and over 2,000 units for seniors. And here again, I would guess that these numbers have only gone up in terms of the shortage because we are still not catching up with, um, with demand, sadly. So the other crisis that we're facing today is climate change. Um, and odds are those of you who've joined this webinar heard about this from Mountain True and are probably already um, climate champions, environmental champions. Um, so you may know this already, but for those who are new to it, our summers are getting hotter. Our rainstorms are getting less frequent, but more intense leading to more droughts and also more floods. Some of our native species in Western North Carolina, like the brook trout and hellbenders, are running out of suitable habitat in which to survive, and the list goes on. This image is a map showing where biodiversity is most at risk in America, and you can in North America, and you can see a lot of dark red in our part of Appalachia. This map was created for a report by the New York Times, and in that report, they said that Southern Appalachia is a hot spot for species at risk of vanishing, which I just find really sad. So where we live and how we build the structures that we live and work in and how we move around our community to get in between the houses or the, yeah, our homes and our jobs and our schools, um, all of those decisions have huge impacts on our natural environment and its ecology. As reported by the EPA, the transportation sector is the largest contributor to man-made greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And within the sector, light duty vehicles, including passenger tar passenger cars and light duty trucks make up 58% of those emissions. Additionally, heating and cooling buildings or homes accounts for about 43% of all energy use in the United States. So this trend of building larger houses further from city centers is having huge impacts on total greenhouse gas emissions in our country and therefore accelerating climate change impacts on our natural environment. 
So the last two slides uh, were kind of gross and scary. Um, and Neighbors for More Neighbors, WNC and Mountain True, we are here to present a different picture. One piece of the solution to these crises is to change the way that we build our houses and share our communities with our neighbors. We are advocating for more housing choices to be built within our existing neighborhoods where infrastructure and amenities already exist. If we can simply welcome more neighbors to our communities by sharing access to the parks, schools, and roads that we've already built, we can create opportunities for more friends and families to have a piece of that American dream without expanding our carbon footprint further and further across our mountain landscapes. So here I want to talk about some best practices on municipal zoning policy that this program is advocating for. Um, we're looking at like a high level, um, what kinds of policy change can we make across the region in our different towns and cities that would allow for more of the kind of housing development and growth that we think is, is wise and is, is a solution to these crises. Um, these are kind of vague um, best practices because it really varies depending on the municipality, what their particular ordinances and, and zoning policy is. But in general, we want to allow more homes on every lot that allows a single detached house. So currently a lot of our land in cities and towns is zoned such that you can only build a single family detached home. But if we could allow more homes on those lots, that would allow for more neighbors allow one or more accessory dwelling units on all residential lots. And if you're not familiar with ADUs or accessory dwelling units, they can be sometimes called granny flats or they're like above garage apartments, but it's, it's a sort of smaller structure that's separate from the main home, but is on the same, same lot. Allow apartments or mixed use developments in more places, just simply in more places would be great. <laughs> Uh, allowing apartments and mixed use developments to include more homes if we can put more units into those structures. Again, we're taking advantage of efficiencies. Removing or reducing minimum lot sizes and allow fee simple lot division. So sometimes how tightly packed you can you can place homes in a development is dependent on the, the zoning policy um, and, and minimum lot sizes dictate that. So if we could reduce those minimum lot sizes so that you could put houses closer together that too would be helpful. Allowing manufactured homes everywhere. There is some stigma against manufactured homes, unfortunately, but they are one of the most naturally occurring affordable housing options for many members of our community. And they, the newer ones have gotten way more energy efficient than they used to be. Um, so we're trying to change some of that um, assumption that people hear about or have when they think about manufactured homes. And then lastly, allowing very small homes. So tiny homes, but similar to manufactured homes, but just smaller footprint homes. There's less space to heat and cool uh, and it can be closer into town. Those are some of the best practices that we are pushing for. So that's the policy level. Now I wanna talk about another piece or another arm of this program and that is project level advocacy. So there are certain projects that are proposed and go through some process to get a, a permit. Uh, that Mountain True is starting to look at and say, you know what, we think this is a, an example of the kind of development, the kind of growth that makes sense for our community. So Project Aspire is an example of a project like that that is in downtown Asheville. Um, and at the outset, I will say we are doing this work all across the region. This project is not appropriate for really any other town or city across uh, Western North Carolina. But in Asheville, this this scale of a project makes a lot of sense, we think. So it's it's got 19 and 20 story buildings, so it's pretty big and it's a large uh, lot that's made up of a couple different lots pieced together, including the First Baptist Church there in the middle. And on the left hand, there's the YMCA building uh, would be torn down and, and become these, these structures that you see here in this picture. Um, but it's again, a great example of the kind of housing we support because it is in the center of downtown. Uh, there would be 450 to 650 residential units built if this is fully built out as it's currently envisioned. Um, and that's just a ton of people and families that could live right in the middle of Asheville. 20% um, of those units are going to be designated affordable, which means they'll be subsidized and set aside for folks who are making below the area median income. Um, Multifamily housing like this, when it's, when it's taller buildings or, or houses next to each other, units next to each other, is more energy efficient than single family detached homes. It just takes less energy to heat and cool each unit because they're smaller than, than standalone homes. And they're also, they can benefit from shared walls. 
a location like this is also walkable to all sorts of um, daily needs, amenities. And so residents in these buildings will drive less each day um, to accomplish their daily tasks. I also love that Asheville has a transit system and the way that our transit system is currently structured, we only have one central transfer hub. So if you were trying to get from the west side of town to the east side of town, you have to take a bus to the center of town, wait, change buses, and then you can get to the east side of town. So it really eats up a lot of time and is very inefficient as a way to get across town from one side to the other, but it's pretty workable if you're just coming from one side of town to the center and then back out. But by living in the center of town where this project is going to be located, really open up your access um, and convenience of using public transportation, which is pretty exciting too. Um, then lastly, I'll say if we spread the like four to 600 homes that are envisioned in this project out into the standard single family detached format that is most common these days, we'd be converting far more farmland and forest of our region into asphalt roads and rooftops. So this feels like a much better use of our land for multiple reasons while creating a lot of housing. The next example I want to point out is a smaller scale one. This is uh, Hawkins Point since in Hendersonville, um, and it is a three story, 43 unit affordable senior apartment complex located on 6th Avenue. Another great example, because it is right in town, it's multifamily. So again, you get the energy efficiency of it. Uh, and it's built on land that was already largely developed, so even though you see a lot of like pavement and parking lot here. Um, there was a much loss of tree or forest. Uh, well, there wasn't forest here, <laughs> badly, uh, to create this this structure, these these houses and this and this parking. Um, and again, if we spread these units or these forty three homes outside of downtown, um, we would just lose a lot more green space and open space. My third and final example of a project that we have supported um, is the Overlook at Lake Chattoog. And this is actually in Hiawassee, Georgia, part of our Western region, uh, includes two of the northernmost counties in Georgia. Um, <clears throat> and this project included 21 duplexes and 33 single family homes. So it is a lot of single family homes here, but you can tell they're pretty tightly packed relative to like the houses around it. So there's one to the right that you can see and maybe one sort of top right corner. Um, these are just much more condensed. So it's a, a better use of land given that this project is proposed to be right on Main Street in literally the center of town. Um, it's across the street from like a Taco Bell and the post office down the street by a block or two from the hospital. And um, this town, Hiawassee, Georgia, their hospital is struggling, much like many places across Western North Carolina are, to maintain staffing levels at the right amount because people can't afford to live there. So it's hard it's hard to fill job openings when there's nowhere for folks to live. Um, so the fact that this project would be walkable, uh, short, short distance walkable to the hospital would be really helpful and all these units were going to be affordable. Unfortunately, this project did not get approved by the county commission, or maybe it was the planning board. I forget who it had to go in front of, but but we supported it then and we support it now. This is just another example of the kind of housing that we think is the most um, beneficial to our neighbors and to the natural environment in our region. So we've talked about the policies that we're advocating for, some of the projects that we are supporting. And then here's another concept, a different sort of solution um, that we like for our region and to address these crises. And it is called missing middle housing. Missing middle housing refers to housing types such as duplexes, triplexes, or townhomes that can be said to have largely been missing from the residential housing market over the last 70 years. So on the left-hand side of this graphic, you see detached single family homes. On the right-hand side, you see, it says mid-rise, but those are probably really high-rise <laughs> apartment or condo complexes. And then everything in the middle is a bunch of different housing types that we just have not built much of in recent decades for a variety of reasons, but that we would like to reintroduce and, and bring back into the mix of what is being constructed for families and neighbors uh, in our communities. So Duplexes, courtyard apartments, townhomes, multiplexes. So they're like three or four story buildings, but that put a number of units in there on one lot. Um, we just feel like these are our, you know, mid-sized uh, homes that can allow for more people to live where there are already amenities and infrastructure, and we should bring them back. <laughs> 
here are some examples of missing middle housing just in, in sort of reality. <laughs> uh, the top left is a duplex. On the top right, you see uh, an accessory dwelling unit or an ADU back behind the main single family home there. On the lower left corner, that is a cottage courtyard. So it's a number of single family homes surrounding a central green open space. And the bottom right, I think is a sixplex. I think that's um, three stories and two units, one on each side of each floor. Um, but yeah, another sort of small scale, you know, could fit in a, in a normal neighborhood, but multi multi-family housing project. So we want more neighbors. <laughs> we think it's good for the env environment and for people. Um, and so I've talked about some of the ways that this program is working uh, from policy advocacy to project level advocacy. We're also doing education programs like this. I'm happy to present to any uh, neighborhood group or, or city government, um, you name it, trying to spread the word about this. Uh, and you may be wondering how you can get involved in this program. Uh, and there are a number of ways that you can do that. Uh, you can join Mountain True as a member or donate to specifically support our housing work. Um, donations and contributions to the organization really help us carry this work forward. Sign up for our newsletter to follow and support our policy campaigns. We have those rolling out this year and we're excited about it. Uh, follow us on social media. I have not been great with my social media game. I'm working on it, <laughs> but we do have Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> I'm really trying to get some more content there, but anyway. Uh, attend our events. So there's events like these, but we're also doing stuff in person um, and, and that will ramp up this year too. Um, so come on out and, and talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you can join our team of volunteers. Some of our volunteers are here tonight, might be able to answer questions or um, share about their volunteer experience, but that, that's really fun. Um, and talk to your friends and neighbors about the benefits to our climate and our community if we can allow housing to be built in our existing neighborhoods. There's just so much natural uh, resistance to infill development or, or building in existing neighborhoods and existing communities. People are reluctant to see their, you know, landscape and their community change, um, in particular with the added structures. But talking about the the other side of that, you know, there's that fear of change, but there, there are real benefits to the environment and to people if we can make a little space uh, and allow for some more housing for more of our friends. Um, and more families in our community to to move in and live next to us. So spread the word, talk it up. Uh, we think it's good stuff. Um, and that concludes my presentation. There's my contact information, which most of you can probably already have uh, or have found on the website. And I am now going to stop sharing and open it up to questions. Let's see. Right here. So if you guys have any questions, you're welcome to forgive that. Um, put them into the chat or come off mute, turn on your camera, say hello. Um, I it, the recording will still go on for a little bit um, in case people have questions that they're willing to share with the general public if someone's watching this video later. But at some point I can turn it off. And if you have a question that you would rather not have uh, captured in the recording, I'm, I'm very open to fielding those that way too. But for now, Let's see what questions you guys might have. Are there any new projects that Mountain True is looking to get involved in advocating for in the Asheville area? That is a great question. Hello, Eva, another Susan Bean <laughs> lurker. <laughs> um, there, there are not any right now that we are preparing to uh, support. One that we reviewed just this past week to evaluate uh, among the various criteria that we have when we look at these projects was um, the one that has been proposed for Hawk Creek recently. Um, and currently our... our our thinking is that the project as it is proposed is not one that we would support uh, for a number of different reasons. It's That's kind of um, a tricky place to get to. There's not a lot of, um, uh, well, there's not hardly any sidewalk to it. Um, and it's just kind of a, a, a narrow valley that's a little difficult to access. So anyway, for a couple of reasons, we don't love it as it is, but we're hoping that maybe the developer as it goes through the process of um, 
trying to get the conditional zoning permit that they'll need could make changes to it um, through the way, through, through that process. And then we might be able to come to a position where we can support it. Um, but anyway, that was the most recent one that we have looked at and, and that's where we stand. Michelle, you have your hand raised. Hey, um, I was curious if you guys have knew the history of or have had any discussions with um, the council of government there. They did exploration into transfer development rights sometime between 2005, 2010. I went to a, a workshop there, an all-day workshop, where they brought in some of the folks in Maryland outside of the D.C. area that have a successful transfer development rights program. I, it didn't go anywhere, but there's some history there of that kind of discussion happening. So just curious if there's any current dialogue around that. Thanks. That's a great question. I do not know the answer to that question. I think Chris Joyal, I saw him lurking in here earlier. He may have more information on that because he has been uh, the director of our Healthy Communities Program at Mountain True for longer than I have. So Chris, if you have information, feel free to hop in here. Otherwise, I will look into it. Yeah, that is a uh, a right that has to be conferred to uh, by the state to uh, municipalities and counties, and thus far the state has not shown an interest in it. Um, it would be an incredible tool, I think, if we had uh, transfer of development rights. I I come uh, originally twenty years ago from Connecticut, where we had a very successful TDR program, um, and it was it was instrumental in being able to set aside a lot of conservation land and provide an incentive for for landowners. Uh, to place their land into conservation. Um, but without that tool available to us coming from Raleigh, uh, we, we don't really have that option right now. So it is something that on a legislative uh, level, we are working with a, a lobbyist in Raleigh, um, exploring different ways to create more uh, and better housing and at the same time, protect the, the critical areas that we that we value so much. So it's it's on our radar and we're working on it. Um, and if we can find uh, legislators that support the effort, we'll certainly do everything we can to push for it. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And feel free to come off, um, I mean, turn on your videos in case anybody wants to make it more of a conversation. Chris, <laughs> the voice coming from a black box. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wearing a hoodie right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. How do you raise hand? Oh, that's okay. You can just go ahead and jump in. Oh. Uh, well, two questions. What uh, what are the specific zoning changes that you're advocating? And could you talk a little bit about scenarios that would lead to gentrification? Good questions. Um, the reason on the slides that the policy specifics are, are not at all specific is because it really does vary per municipality. Um, so I've seen you at events in Asheville. I'm guessing you live in Asheville. Um, we right now are working closely with the city as they are trying to implement the recommendations that came out of their missing middle housing report from last year. Um, and some of those changes that we would support are um, removing parking requirements, um, allowing uh, duplexes, triplexes, three-story buildings in all residential neighborhoods by right. Um, gosh, what are some of the other specifics? There's, I mean, there's really wonky things about like setbacks and, um, floor to area ratio and, um, yeah, there's a, the, the city is considering a whole suite of possible changes. Um, and I, yeah, I could follow up with you on some of the more specific stuff there. Uh, we're also working on the state level, uh, a bill that is currently um, moving through the session. I mean, it's not active session right now, but um, cleared the um, the crossover hurdle last year and we'll, we'll come back to for debate this year that would allow ADUs, uh, accessory dwelling units by right um, in all municipalities. Some municipalities that are not Asheville <laughs> uh, don't allow those right now and it would it would supersede some of those rules and, and make them legal everywhere. Um, so we're working on multiple different levels for different policy changes. Um, hopefully that's helpful. And yeah. then to your second question around gentrification, you know, that is, it is a really interesting challenge, I would say. Um, we are aware that um, adding new construction to neighborhoods can increase property values, but there's also a, a fear from folks that having more multifamily structures in their neighborhoods would decrease property values. So there's actually 
there's sort of two ways to look at it. And it's a little hard to know how allowing this kind of development would impact the price of land, the cost of homes in any given locality. But generally speaking, we feel that adding more housing for more neighbors should in the long term decrease demand because we are providing more housing for more people who need it. And that should um, should lower the cost, the, the price point of, of that housing, especially when it is um, smaller and multifamily. Um, that is, that's a kind of housing that tends to be more affordable than multifamily housing. So um, Eva, are you raising your hand or are you stretching? I'm just raising my hand. I was just going to add um, one thing that is called out in the missing middle housing report from Opticos um, as a way to reduce the pressures of displacement, which is one thing that we're worried about when we're worried about gentrification is to make sure that changes to zoning and changes to the number of units that are allowed on property are applied broadly. So we wouldn't want to implement a change that increased property values dramatically by increasing allowable density in, say, our legacy neighborhoods only. What we would want to do is make sure that we're also increasing allowable density in some of our more affluent neighborhoods like North Asheville. Um, and so we want to make sure, and Kenilworth, so we want to make sure that we're spreading that allowable density broadly so that <laughs> developers are going to build where there's access to opportunity um, and they're not going to focus on areas that maybe already have a supply of affordable housing. So that's one piece, not the only thing. Thanks, Eva. Appreciate the support. Eva is one of our all-star volunteers. <laughs> um, okay, Jane, I see that your hands raised. I'm gonna respond quickly to one of the questions in the chat before we pass to you. Um, how is Neighbors for More Neighbors engaging with the Asheville Buncombe Community Land Trust, which quote, helps to create and maintain housing that will obtain remain permanently affordable. Yeah, we are partnered with the, the land trust. Um, we work with them on um, a coalition of housing advocates in, in the Asheville and Buncombe area called the Success Equation Housing Team. We are working with them to try and build relationships with legacy neighborhoods in particular because they have better relationships and, and more trust with those groups um, to talk about what missing middle housing might offer for their communities um, by way of access to to wealth generation opportunities, um, but wanting to respect uh, any any concerns that they have around threats of vulnerability or displacement. Um, so, you know, we are not in the business of like buying and selling property, um, which the the land trust is, um, but we certainly partner with them and, and our advocates alongside them for the different kinds of anti-displacement policies that the city is considering and also um, changes to um, to zoning and, and policies that might allow for additional housing units to come into our, into our community and perhaps um, become available to the land trust um, to go through their process. Uh, Jane. Yes, so I am wondering how tree preservation fits into this denser housing plan. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, one of the things I would say, and I forget who I heard this from, but I really liked it, is that the enemy of tree canopy is not housing, but it is parking requirements. <laughs> so parking lots really eat up a ton of possible tree canopy. Um, and I would sort of rather shift some of the <laughs> the anger at uh, at loss of tree canopy towards the parking requirements. Um, but I mean, you're right. If we build more structures in town, then we will lose some of the trees on the lots that become housing. However, the threat of continued sprawl and large homes that are taking up large lots further and further from our city and town centers are really going to chew up that tree canopy at a much faster rate. And so it is the balance in towns and in city centers to try and mitigate the heat island effect by maintaining a tree canopy. And there are some other policies that, that we support um, that help maintain existing tree canopy and, and require it for developers who are building multifamily housing, that they have to plant a bunch of trees for you know trees that they remove. Um, there are sort of other ways to create and maintain uh, tree canopy within our, our cities and towns. But 
overall, I would say it is better for the environment to have infill development rather than sprawl in terms of the um, quantity and then acreage of, of trees that we would lose. Yes, I can understand that. Um, so, I mean, is there anything we can do? I mean, you know, we used to have a, a slope rule, a slope law, you know, you couldn't build on slopes of a certain percentage. Yeah, there's, a, there's a steep slope ordinance in Asheville. That's yeah. Ordinance. And do we enforce that at all? Do you know? Chris, do you want to take this one? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, we do, uh, and the and, and that happens at the administrative level. We have a technical review committee uh, that reviews applications for uh, development. And if you're building on a steep slope, there's it gets pretty complicated. You know, there, there's some pretty uh, involved math that comes along with it. But there are restrictions as to the density and the amount of clearing that you can uh, incur on the slopes, and that changes as the slope becomes uh, steeper. So uh, it, the the housing itself that's appearing on the steep slopes is a concern. I would also add that the roads leading to those houses can also be really detrimental uh, to slope integrity. So it's something that Buncombe County has and Asheville has a, an even more uh, vigorous steep slope ordinance. Um, and we're beginning to see surrounding counties uh, at least entertaining the idea of, uh, of um, a steep slope ordinance themselves. Okay, thanks. Sure, and I, I see a comment in the chat about how denser housing can mean more vehicles. Uh, and I would actually push back on that. I'm I'm guessing that housing could maybe mean more vehicles, but denser housing, if it's in close to city centers, would provide access to, you could walk around, you could take the bus, you have sort of other um, ways to get to things that you need. And so you might be able to live a car light lifestyle, perhaps. <laughs> maybe you could have a scooter instead of a vehicle. Um, but also if you, if we continue to sprawl, um, those homes are definitely going to need to have one or two vehicles per household to be able to drive across the county or across the region to, to get to where they need to go. So I don't know that I agree that denser housing can mean more vehicles. It could possibly mean more vehicles like within a, a small area, but I would say environmentally speaking, it's, it's actually probably a, a recipe for fewer vehicles and less, less carbon emissions from cars. Um, Stevie, love your question. How are developments submitted for Mountain True support? Um, you know, there's not a, there's not an official process for that. Um, some have come across our radar because we saw them in the newspaper or something, but, um, often it's, it's people will contact us either asking us to support a project or asking us to oppose a project. And that will trigger our internal evaluation, um, process. But if anyone is interested in having Mountain True look at a particular project um, to consider whether we would support or oppose it, I would say email me or Chris, and we are more than happy to to check it out and, and see what we think and weigh the pros and cons, because there are always trade-offs for any any proposed project and any proposed development. I mean, there's no, there's no perfect scenario. Um, so we're happy to run it through our, our checklist and see what we think. Great question. Any other questions from any of the other Susan Beans out there? <laughs> All right, well, then I may turn off the recording um, in case people have.